about integrating systems into your church. I, as I was talking to some of uh, some of the conference goers here earlier, you know, I came up in a spirit-filled church environment where sort of our belief was let God come in and let, let God have his way. Let's just have a move of God. Let's let the Holy Spirit come in and, you know, change the world. And, you know, what they said in Alabama, let go and let God. That's what they said. Let go and let God. Um, but I realized that we need a move of God and we need order. <laughs> we need structure. And we don't need our church to grow based on, you know, it was Easter and then it was revival and then there was a great, worship service, but we need structures that create ongoing growth. Literally every week. What if I told you that literally every week, your church can grow every week. June, the worst year, uh, month of the year for church attendance is a church growth month. Why? Because there's a guest there. Uh, there's some guests there, all right? You might have a lot of your regular attenders at the beach or at the mountains, but there will be guests there, and you have systems in place that convert those guests into uh, fully assimilated members and people who serve in the church. Hey, we have some seats up front, a couple right over here, and just a couple right over here, so you guys make yourself right at home. And when Pastor Phil gets back, we've got some more of these cards we're going to pass out. So what I want to do today, I actually, I, I gave you this. I'm actually the president um, and CEO of 24 to Double. I, I pastor and have pastored the same church for over 20 years, about 20, almost 23 years. That's what I do. That's my real job. That's my focus. And then occasionally I get to come out and do something like this as well. I don't really like to get church growth advice from a guy who used to pastor a church or once pastored a church or goes to church or has a lot of ideas. I want to hear from a guy who is, how many of you know, I should just ask, how many of you are pastors or serving in a local church? All right. Okay, great, great. So you understand that the way church ministry was done 10 years ago doesn't work today. It doesn't. And the way it was done two years ago is very different than it is today. So that's my commitment as a coach. I coach lots of pastors and I uh, train leaders is that I stay involved and, and I pastor my church uh, that I uh, have, have pastored and, and our church has grown from 60 to several thousand over the years uh, in, a, in really a relatively small town. How many of you are, are, are serving in larger cities? Raise your hand, bigger cities. All right, uh, smaller towns, raise your hand. Good mixture, great. So 24 to Double has... Um, hundreds of churches from small towns to large cities and uh, in, in, in about 23 different countries. So this, this is a system that's worked in a lot of places. I'm not really here to talk about that. Uh, I just wanted to show you this and let you, let me give you a, a code. Uh, you might want to write this down somewhere, but if you, if you are to get anything from our ministry, we have a discount code uh, just for this conference, CLF 2023. When you get on the website, if you see anything on there that you think would help your church, any training or any materials, uh, you'll get a 20% discount by putting in CLF 2023. And um, let me talk to you about this state of the American church, and I, I hope you can follow along here. Um, I want you to look here at, at this graph on the right. This is a church health statistics in America. 85% of American churches are currently in decline. Only about 6% are growing. Uh, this is contrasted to our churches that we're putting our training system in where we're seeing great uh, church growth. And it's not just uh, the, the church in crisis, it's the pastor. Really, it's mostly the reality that the pastor's in crisis. More than 1,300 pastors are fired each month without a major cause. Each month, about 1,200 pastors leave the ministry. 67% of pastors' spouses say they are dissatisfied with their marriage. 75% of pastors spend less than one evening a month with their spouse or friends. And clergy divorce has risen 65% in the last 20 years. It's actually true. Now, this is a vacant seat right here if you want. It's actually true now that um, the divorce rate among pastors is higher than the divorce rate among committed church members. It's a real crisis. Raise your hand if you didn't get one of those cards. Uh, Pastor Phil's got those cards for you. Some of, some of the use up, up here in the front, Pastor Phil. 
So let me keep walking you through this. 70% of pastors say, I don't have one close friend. 71% have financial problems. And the current burnout rate for pastors, people who uh, get some kind of certification or a degree or an ordination and then give it up and go do something else, is a 50% burnout rate. That's very high among professional um, uh, career paths. And it's higher if you graduated from seminary. Look out, you seminary graduates in here, okay? Be careful. So it's not working. Now, I, I believe the answer is right here. This is cr what I call Christ's model for the church. Jesus himself. He gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, this is, this is the anointing, the calling that, that Jesus put in place to structure his church for growth. And here's what it was for, to equip his people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So to equip the saints. Uh, now, the, the American Western model is a corporate model. We've adopted a corporate model uh, the same way you might have a church board and employees to produce product. Uh, a, uh, I'm sorry, a, a corporate board, I should say. In a business, you'd have a corporate board and uh, an employee structure to produce a product. The, the church is structured much the same way. You've got a church board and your employees are your staff members and the product is satisfying the church members. That is not Christ model for church. That's why the American church is in such crisis is we, we've got a Western corporate model. The, 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 the model for the church is that you in this room understand your calling, your gifting as an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher. You understand your calling and your gifting and you're equipping your church members to do the work of the ministry. You are not called to do the work of the ministry. You're called to equip saints in your congregation to do the work of the ministry. That is why, and I'm just going to back up, that's why all these scary, horrible numbers are going on. Pastors working themselves to death, exhausted all the time, because they un unfortunately misunderstand the reality that this is not what they were called to do. Okay. Now, um, th th what I'm sharing you today a little bit of an overview, but I'm going to show you uh, 24 to double is 24 modules uh, trained at your church via the internet, streamed directly to your location. I'm going to show you a quick overview of two of those modules that I think are most important. And here's what I have prayed for. Um, I, I want you to hear this. My heart for you, I'm praying and believing that in this room is anointing and calling, of course, there's passion in this room. There's also great intelligence and entrepreneurial spirit in this room. Many years ago, I, I grew up in a um, sort of backwards denomination um, that lacked a lot of understanding of systems and, and how to help the church to grow. But I went to a conference much like this, and I heard someone speak, and he, he basically flipped a light switch on in a dark part of my brain and made me think differently. And I, I realized for the first time, wait a minute, we, we don't have to give away the message that Jesus is real, that the Holy Spirit is for today. We can have that message and a new method. You understand that the message is eternal, but the method is temporary. The message is eternal, but the method is temporary. Okay, what is working right now? You know, the church in America blew up 100 years ago under something called Sunday school. It was amazing. Churches grew like crazy. That was the God-ordained, anointed method for the hour. But that was, not the, that was not the message. It wasn't an eternal message that you gather in classrooms like this and have a guy talk in front of 20 people at a time. That's not ordained of God. It just worked, you know. Uh, unfortunately, most of those churches are still trying to do it that way. I, what, I'm, what I learned was that while the message is eternal, the method is temporary. And so there's different methods. And so um, what, what I want to show you today and what I've been praying uh, over, this, over this time today is that a light would switch on, would switch on in, in your head. 
and you would not only learn the things I'm going to show you, but you're, you'd just start thinking creatively, and you would see how to integrate this into your own context. Contextualization is so valuable. How does this work in my church? How does this work with my people? How do I put a system in place that will structure ongoing growth for my church? Okay, Church growth is not a bad thing. Jesus said very clearly, I'm throwing a banquet. I've got a big table. I want my house filled. You go into the streets, highways, alleys, compel them to come in. Compel from the original Greek means anything that's not illegal. That's my own definition, okay? Compel, drag, beg, talk them into, bribe them, you beat them, get, you know, compel. I believe God wants his house full. All right, so this is from module two in 2040 Double. How do you involve, we just got done saying, uh, Jesus actually said in Ephesians uh, 4, that your job is to equip saints to do the ministry. So let's talk about how to get laity into the ministry. I'm going to show you the wrong methods of church leadership that I've observed, the staff run model, the desperate volunteer model, and the chaos model. Then I'm going to show you Christ's model, okay, the team approach. Uh, understand your church grows by the ratio of, of laity. You understand this word laity? It's like an old church. It just means church member involvement. Four to one. So for every one person you have involved, four additional people will be there. Go home this Sunday. Go count how many volunteers there are. People on the front door greeting, people serving in kids' church. If you have Sunday school, count your Sunday school teachers. People uh, on the praise team, count yourself. Everybody serving, multiply that by five. That's your attendance. That's your attendance. Uh, within a few numbers, that's going to be your attendance. So when I learned that, again, a dark part of my brain flipped on a switch and I said, you know what? The fastest way to grow the church is not by addition, but by multiplication. If instead of me saying, I'm just going to pick one or two people up, and I, and I want to keep doing that because personal evangelism is key. But if I would get someone who's just been sitting on the seats doing nothing and involve them in the ministry, all of a sudden I grew by four or more people. And, and so if you were to come to my church today, what you find remarkable is not a remarkable preacher, remarkable singing, remarkable facilities, not a big city of any uh, stretch. You'd find remarkable how many volunteers are serving. When a volunteer serves, that's my church, not the church or your church. Uh, a vol By the way, if you've not done these statistics, you should know this, but your volunteers pay your salary. So 100 people in the room, 20 people are paying your salary. The people who are volunteering, those are the people. You want a bigger salary, get more volunteers. It's called a mic drop, all right? You get more, you need a bigger budget for the church, get more volunteers. It's all about the volunteers. Why? Because there's an energy. When the volunteer uh, is serving, it's not like it was your, for instance, I got volunteers who helped me pattern my sermon, especially when the church was smaller. I wanted to make it more creative. I've got an idea of what I think a sermon needs to sound like, uh, but unfortunately, I'm 50 years old. My target is 20, 25 years old. I don't know what they're watching on Netflix. I don't know what the lingo is. I hand them my sermon notes. They change a few titles, you know. Instead of I'm giving an illustration from Little House on the Prairie, you know, <laughs> I'm giving an illustration from, you know, something new, New Amsterdam or some show on Netflix that's, that's new and cutting edge. So you know what that does for them? Because they participated in that, they love that sermon twice as much as they would have loved it if I just came in there. That's the same in worship, kids' ministry, greeting, everything. So I want to grow the church faster. I'm going to get more volunteers involved. If you don't know how to get lady involved, you cannot grow a church. End of story. I, you can have a big event, okay? You can, you can bring in somebody famous and, you know, get a big attendance on one day, but you won't grow the church if, if you don't understand that. So watch this, Ephesians 2. It's by grace you've been saved through faith, not from yourself. It's a gift from God, not by works so that no one should boast. So watch this. Your church members need to know this. We are God's work. Everybody say work. work. We're workmanship, and we're created in Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So your congregation should be doing work for the ministry. Oh, I just come to church. I support it. And I give lots of money. That's, that's a good start. You have to work, though. And, and you're going to see this. You're going to see this just a minute. These, these workers, these servants in your church, they were created by Jesus to do these good works and already prepared 
in advance. Paul's going to explain that to us in just a minute, how they're already prepared to do these good works. Now, because the church hasn't been following Christ's models, we have very unhealthy systems. I'm going to, I'm going to rush through this, okay? Again, if you, if you go to 24 to double and get the, tri uh, the trial, there's like a three-month trial, you can, all this stuff is available there and, and a whole lot more. The staff run model is this, all things to all people. Uh, by an overworked staff, staff members. It might be volunteers, you know, a handful of volunteers and staff. They're doing everything. So they do things they don't enjoy, they don't want to do, and they're not good at because they're not gifted to do those things. Remember, the Bible says Jesus want we're his workmanship to do good works prepared in advance. You're not prepared to do all the different works. Okay. You're prepared to do specific works. And if you just think, oh, it's a corporate model, we're going to hire staff to do the work. First of all, you're going to run out of money. You can't hire enough staff to do all the work. Secondly, you're going to just shove them in areas they're not prepared in advance to do. So they don't like it. They're not good at it. See, I, I like doing this right here. I'm loving this because I was prepared in advance to do this. Okay. If you go by our booth, I've got a booth out in the exhibit hall, a guy named Jason, my assistant, one of my team members, he's sitting at that booth. If he were standing up here talking right now, he would hate this. And so would you. Okay. He wasn't prepared in advance to do that, right? When you find what you're prepared to do, you're going to love it and you're going to be good at it. Okay. Our staff run church model is we just hire people, shove them in there. They do whatever we need them to do. It doesn't work. And so we go to this one, the desperate volunteer model. This is one I grew up under. You throw the newest recruit in the biggest area of need. It requires no faith because at least the slot is filled. This is the way it worked in my little church I grew up in. Somebody came in and got saved today. Walked all the way to the front, prayed the sinner's prayer. They're crying. They're so excited. Jesus loves them. And the preacher goes, now don't you want to work in children's church? What are you going to say? I mean, you just got saved. Yes, I'm going to work. I mean, he doesn't like it, and he's terrible at it, and, you know, nobody wants him to do it, but he, he doesn't want to stop doing it because he doesn't want to let you down. You don't want to tell him not to do it because you don't want to hurt his feelings. So he doesn't quit the ministry. He quits the church. Have you noticed that when people stop serving? They don't go back from serving back to the pew. They go out the door, Okay. We, we teach that you just ask people to serve in an area that they are passionate about, and they only serve for one year. Just serve for one year. Actually, uh, when I recruit people for Easter, so we add additional Easter services, our church always doubles every year for Easter, always doubles every year for Easter. And when that happens, I tell people, I just need you to serve one week. Just serve one week, do these extra services. I know they're going to keep serving. We're going to keep scheduling them. I just tell them to do it for one week, and they keep doing it. All right. When they come out of growth track, our normal structured system where every week a every, every week new uh, new guests go right into growth track. We have it every week after every service. They go right in. We never ask them to do this forever. You know, like the Sunday school class I grew up in, the same person is teaching that Sunday school class that was teaching it when I was a little boy. Nobody's going to volunteer because they think it's a life sentence. Who wants to do that? Okay. So we ask them to do it for one year. And then, you know, we can, we can, uh, we can transition them out if they don't like it or, or we know they're not good. The chaos model is a combination. You got a few staff members and you got a bunch of desperate volunteers and the squeaky wheel gets the oil. That's the way a lot of churches are run. Okay. Um, so the church should be entirely built around spiritual gifts instead. Instead of around needs. Instead of around we have an opening or we, we need to plug someone in. You got to learn there's uh, raw materials in the church. I'm going to skip. There's a really cool illustration here. Just can, pretend you're inspired. I'm going to skip that, okay? Just everybody, you're inspired, okay? But let me go right to the scripture. For as in one body we have many members, and all the members don't have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Um, so this word function is where we get the Greek word proxis. And it means the activity of the Holy Spirit through you. You're a Holy Spirit-empowered person. You have a function in the body of Christ. And Paul's going to later in the, in the very next verses, he's going to give us a list of seven functional gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the backbone of, of my system of training is the spiritual gifts. These are particular gifts that God gives each Christian that motivates them 
so that when the Christian spiritually discerns his gift, he leaves insecurity and goes into a ministry, a position of ministry. Here's what they look like. Verse 6, we have different gifts according to the grace given to us. You'll notice all these seven gifts. Everybody in your church has a gift mix. It's not just one of these gifts. It's a mixture of these gifts. Okay? If the gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it's serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it's encouraging, let him encourage. If it's contributing or giving, let him give. If it's leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. So these, these, are, the, these are the raw materials. I'll stop right there. These are the raw materials that should be used and cultivated. You know, you can take a $5 bar of iron about that big. It's useful for almost nothing. That's why it's $5. You can take that same $5 of iron and bend it like a horseshoe. It costs you $50. You can take that same $5 bar of, of iron and make it into fine balance springs for Swiss watches, and it's a million dollars worth of iron. What have I told you? In your church, there's, there's millions of dollars worth of raw materials. But you've got to have a system in place that tells them where do they go? How do they serve? What do we get the most out of them? This is it. This is the Holy Spirit telling us different people have different gifts. I want to walk you through those gifts, see if it doesn't connect with you. So the gift of, a, of, of leadership, also administration. It's got some strengths and some weaknesses. This person's a motivator, an organizer, a delegator, and a long-range planner. Sometimes they expect others to perform too high of a level, and they can seem uncaring. This person should serve on a team as your team leader, okay? The gift of prophecy. Now, you know I'm going straight through Romans 12. This is exactly what Paul said, straight through. Gift of prophecy should be on every team. Every team needs someone with that gift. They have a passion for the word, and they are a great prayer leader. Their mistakes are they're seldom organized, and they don't see the big picture. Now, here's what's happening right now. In every church, if you don't have a good system in place, you, you've already got gifted people. You have people with a prophetic gift. These people usually end up in leadership. Why? Because they're passionate. They talk about it. They say, Pastor, the, the children are, are our future. There's nothing more important in this church than children. We need great children to ministry. And the pastor goes, wow, you're the one. You should lead. And you know what? The people with the most passion are usually very unorganized. And they rally all the passionate people around them, and they, they have a big cheerleading thing, you know. Say church starts at 9 o'clock. They're all there, at, you know, because prophetic prayer people are late for everything. They just can't get there on time, all right? So when they finally get in there and they're kind of late and they're gathered up for a prayer huddle and the Holy Ghost is moving, they're so excited, there's first-time guests standing at the booth trying to check their kids in and they're thinking, I'm not giving my kid to this group of people. They can't even get checked in in time. Okay, so what does that mean? Do we throw these people away? No, because, let me back you up, if a person with the administrative gift is doing all the ministry, all they're doing is yelling at everybody, get over here on time, check this kid in, sit down and do what you're supposed to. So this is why God put the gifts together as he chose to. When you do it the way you choose to, see, I'm this guy right here. I know this guy's problems because when I first started my church, I hired all people just like me. We were super organized and nobody liked us. <laughs> You know, we because nobody could do it right. We couldn't get anybody to get on board with us, okay? Watch. I'm going to take you through all seven of these gifts. Then you need people in the mercy gift. They have the opposite of the administration gift. Caring. They sense people's grief and pain. They are discerning. They are a peacemaker. Don't put them in charge of anything. They can't find their car keys. They take in stray animals on their way home from church. These are the nicest human beings on the planet. But what if every team member had the nicest person as the recruiter could just walk up to you on a given Sunday? You just told him, hey, you don't, have to, you don't have to teach the children anything. You don't have to be in charge of kids' check-in. You're going to walk around and tell people how much we love these children, how much they are valuable, and how that you could help us do that. What if you had a recruiter on every team? I think that's what that mercy gift is best for. Then there's an encourager. 
Again, straight from Romans chapter 12. They give sound advice. They preach often. Many of you in here, you have this gift. They do personal counseling. They may be too preachy sometimes. What if every team had an encourager? Now, again, I'm an administrator. If you don't show up to volunteer on the day you're supposed to volunteer, I, my administrative head gets a little bit cranky with you. You signed up. You said you're going to be here. The easiest thing in the world is to send me a text message. Where were you? That is not a good follow-up for a volunteer. Your volunteers are not only going to come to work for you for free, they're going to drop off 10% of their income when they do it. Okay. So you know who needs to check on them? This person, an encourager who says, hey, we have missed you the last couple Sundays. You haven't been here. I just want to make sure you're okay. And then that guy's going to say, hey, well, you know what? I've been going through some things. You know, what can we pray with you about? You, you know, and, and you know what? You need to take the pressure. I used to feel so bad about I'll, I'll have a meeting and I'll forget to pray before we start. I'm halfway through the thing and I'm like, we, we, we should pray, you know. <laughs> the prayer people, you know what? You want to help my feelings was? I have to be me. I have to be me. I'm organizer guy. I'm leader guy. I'm structure guy. All right? And you know, the good thing is God knew that. So he gave me prayer guy. Prayer guy is on my team. Who's prophetically gifted in this room? Raise your hand. Come on. You know, you're, you know that's your gift. Wonderful. I love you people. I need you people. You're the people that go, slow down, pastor. Let's pray before we get started. I'm like, oh, yes, of course. Let's pray, right? How many of you know you are gifted as an encourager? Come on, raise your hand. You know I'm an encourager. I need you people. Because I'm going to be like, why wasn't Bob here? And, and, and you're going to be like, hey, let me, let me check on Bob, okay? I don't think he can take you, all right? He's already had enough trouble in his life, right? But then there's a teacher. Biblical teaching, um, they, they love to do what they do. What if every team member, or every team in your church had somebody who was training? It was their job to train. And they would train you in how you did the ministry and what you were supposed to do and where to be and what time to get there, right? The mercy people aren't going to do that. The mercy people are going to love, huddle up, have fun, you know, bring potato chips and, 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 and bake a casserole. We need those people. But they're not going to train anybody. That's okay. God gave a teaching gift. Now, here's what's funny. We, we do um, a spiritual gift test. It's available. You can use it at your church. It's an online uh, uh, gift test. And 80% of all people who take the gift test score high in the area of helps and services. Isn't that awesome? It's almost like God knows what he's doing, doesn't it? If everybody wants the microphone, it's going to be a mess, right? 80% just want to set up the chairs, right? They want to run the cameras. They want to make sure the AC is working. They want to, you know, that's wonderful. And so these are people who work behind the scenes. Better that they know this is their gift. And they don't try to grab the microphone from you, okay? They know this is their gift. We help them identify that. And then the gift of giving. This is a person who loves to give and loves to motivate others to give. If you can empower this person instead of me trying to get people to give, a church member, maybe a business leader in the community gets up and talks about giving. Now, the, the reason I'm walking you through all of this is because what we usually do is we find that one passionate person. Let's just say he's over the choir. All right, maybe he's on staff. Maybe we've got a full-time music director. And we say, okay, who's going to lead this ministry? Who's in charge of making major decisions? We say, okay, Ben. Uh, let's just call his name Ben. Okay, Ben's going to lead this ministry. I mean, that's, that's who we're paying for. Okay, he's the apostle of the ministry. Okay, he's the leader. Okay, who's going to care for the spiritual direction of this church, who, uh, of this ministry, this, this uh, choir ministry? Well, Ben, of course. I mean, isn't he the leader? Okay, now he's apostle and the prophet. Okay, now who's going who's gonna to recruit and build up the choir? Well, Ben, what are we paying Ben for? That's Ben's job. Isn't he? So he's apostle, prophet, evangelist. He's growing and building the team. All right, who's going to shepherd when somebody doesn't show up, when my Aunt Judy, you know, uh, got sick and had surgery? Nobody even checked on her. Whose fault is that? That's Ben's fault. Ben's in charge. So now he's apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor. And who's going to teach me how to play my instrument? I've got a guitar, but I don't know. Well, Ben, we're paying Ben. So now we've asked Ben to be apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. We've asked Ben simply to be Jesus Christ. <laughs> and I refer you back to all these statistics of burnout in the ministry. 
And just let me tell you, some of you in this room, I've never spoken to a group of pastors where there wasn't somebody in this room. You are right there. You're trying to be apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. You can't be all that. You can't be all that. You're burning yourself out. You're wearing yourself out. We need a structure, a system in place that empowers multiple people. I tell my people regularly, I am not the most spiritual person in this church. I'm just the one who likes to talk a lot. Okay? I get the mic because I'm good at talking. That doesn't make me the Billy Graham of our local church. Okay, You've got a calling. Your spiritual gift is, is important as well. So um, I don't think I'm going to, I know I'm not going to have time to go over this. I'm going to skip this. But we ask you to make seven teams. Um, put all, uh, all five of these, or, or actually all seven uh, team roles in place among seven teams. You run the whole church around seven teams that have all seven of those gifts. What if your worship team had, uh, you know, someone who was the leader, someone who was the prayer leader, someone who was the encourager, someone who was the recruiter, or someone who was the trainer? What if, what if you, every, every one of these teams, you had a follow-up team that you absolutely knew there was somebody there who would lead the charge in following up on people who visited the church. You knew there was someone who would be the spiritual prayer leader. You knew there was someone there who would be the recruiter that would build up the team. There was someone there who would encourage when the team was kind of uh, faltering or someone fell out of the ministry. All these teams we want to train. Now that, that's sort of a snapshot of what we do in that empowering laity. I want to show you one more thing. I'm going to talk a, lot, a little bit about the importance of outreach. Um, scripture says you'll receive power. Jesus said when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses. And you, you all know this, right? Jerusalem is where you're standing. Judea is the surrounding area. Samaria is an area that you don't want to go to. You know, people don't, you don't like those people and those people don't like you. And the ends of the earth is, of course, the ends of the earth. God says you're going everywhere, okay? You're going to go everywhere. Outreach is how we do that. Outreach is getting them there and assimilation is keeping them there. Do you have an outreach team in your church? And do you have an assimilation team in your church? Okay. The, the, when I say that, they're, that our church grows even in the month of June, everybody ought to be growing right now. This is Easter season, right? Everybody should be growing in the fall. First of the year, everybody grows. Can you grow in the summer? All right. Well, if you have systems in place, you're always getting new people there. It might be a low attendance because half your congregation's at the beach, but the people that really matter is first time attenders. By the way, Pastor, you will never, ever, ever, ever grow your church by the people who are already there. If you're coming in and, and, and in the lobby, you're talking about, you know, old brother Fred who always wants to talk about his ingrown toenail every Sunday and wants you to pray again for his toe, your church's not going to grow, you know. I, I'm going to go right past Fred. We're praying about that toe. I'll pray for that on Monday. Right now I'm going to this guy. I don't know his name, this new family, right? So we're always getting new people here. And if I have a system to keep them, then the church will grow at all times. And the difference between a growing church and a dying church is one word. Everybody say that word with me. Amen. Let me tell you something. I have taught this material in hundreds of churches. Churches where the pastors cannot preach. They're awful. Churches where the music is terrible. Churches where it doesn't seem like there's 10 people in the community. Churches where the building is awful. And if they can do this right, the church will absolutely grow. There's one church that I taught this to. The first time I taught this material, it was at my local church. And just churches from uh, around th that part of the state came in. And there was this such a backwards church. I'm not going to mention what kind of church it was, but it's one of the most backwards kind of churches. And I thought to myself, this guy's out of here week one. Nothing I say will he like. That church grew to becoming one of the top 100 fastest growing churches in America. There were, you know that, that, that list that's in the Outreach Magazine every year? They were on that list. In fact, we've had six 24 to double churches on that list, including my church, okay? So the, 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 if you can get them to, and I can't listen to this guy. I couldn't listen to that guy preach for five, I would run out of the building, okay? One of the fastest growing churches in America. Why? Because they do this. They get this right. Why do people go to churches? About 8% walked in. 
You know, they just came. Their grandmother been praying for them. They saw a Billy Graham crusade. They decided they needed to go. 3% liked a program. We spend money, 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 time, time, time on this program, this program, this program. It grows the church. 3%. Okay, nothing. 10% liked you. Sorry about that. 3% had a need. Uh, 2% were evangelized. 4% loved Sunday school. And 80%. We're attracted by a family or friend. Watch. I want to show you some math. Okay, I'm going to skip this. 82% of persons active in church came by a friend. The average church member can identify seven unchurched friends. Listen carefully. Do that math. Average person has a circle of unchurched friends of seven people. They work with them. They go to school with them. They are members of their family. And 83% of the people who don't go to church in a survey said, if a friend invited me to church, I would go to church. Now start doing that math in your head. A hundred people, in fact, I think I did it right over here. If your church has a hundred, now you can divide. If you've got 50, divide it in two. If you've got 200, multiply however you need to. But if you had a hundred people, that is 700 purposeful invites. I don't mean we're just randomly going down the street, passing out cards, knocking on doors in apartment complexes. I mean purposeful, I know these people. Every one of my 100 members have seven friends or family. They invite them. Statistics tell us 82% of people invited by a friend will come. That means your church of 100 has 574 people who would come if you could convince your church members to do one thing, and that thing is what? Invite. That's why I say the difference in a growing and a dying church is one word, invite. If 82% of those present in the church came because a friend of the, in the church invited them, what can we do to encourage more invitations to happen? People invite friends because they love their church. They're proud of the church's reputation, the worship style, the sermons, the professionalism, the ambiance. You got to get that stuff cleaned up. Women won't come back to a church if the bathroom stinks. Pastor can raise a dead man in the altar service. Mama ain't coming back if it stinks in the bathroom. Not going to happen. You, you know, it, it has to have a, a certain ambiance, a certain professionalism. Um, I, I could talk a lot about that. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to skip all this, y'all. Again, this is online. Um, church needs to come up with activities that give its members a reason to invite their unchurched friends back to the church. Donald McGraven said a, a growing church will need to have as many people involved in outreach as in all other activities inside the church. When the consultant that, that I used to work with taught me that for my church, he said the most important team in a church is the outreach team. And it's the team most churches don't even have. When he said that, I didn't even have that team. I'm not going to ask you if you have that team, okay? I've been sitting where you are when I thought about that. So if you've got a church of 100 and you've got 20 people volunteering, you need 20 more people doing outreach. Let me give you quick seven rules of outreach because I do want to, I want to give you time for questions and answers. The more people exposed to your church, the more people who will make it their church home. What do I mean by that? Have events, have activities. Uh, we've had high school graduation, preschool graduation. We had a dental symposium at our church. If somebody wants to use the church, come on board because it just makes people comfortable. That's the first rule, exposure. Repetition, the more times they have a reason for coming back to your church, the more permanent they will come. Now, this is very important. When a first-time guest comes to your church, your number one goal is to get them to come back the very next week. Assimilation rates in a church... You see a first-time guest come to your church. He meets you in the back door, and he always tells you this, Pastor, that's one of the greatest sermons I've ever heard in my life. I want to hurt your feelings. He tells me that too. He tells everybody that, okay? And walks out that door, and there's a 92% chance you will never see that person again. They just told you that's the greatest sermon ever. So what are you going to do to get them to come back the next week? Because if they come back the next week, you went from 8% to 25% chance of keeping them. And if they come back three weeks in a row, you went to a 50% chance. It, it explodes. So I'm not at the back door being like, well, come back again, brother. I'm, coming, I'm, I'm at the back door saying, hey, next Sunday, we have a special breakfast for you. 
We want you to come next Sunday. I'll be uh, in that breakfast. I'll just be sharing a little bit about who our church is. Now, how do I know that? Because I do it every single Sunday, 52 Sundays out of the year we have pastor's breakfast for somebody to come and meet us. Again, that's one of the modules we teach. And guess what we do when we come to pastor's breakfast? People are like, well, we're just new to the town. We're trying to find the right church. And I'll say something like, that's great. Find the right church, but I need you to be back here next week, okay? Because next week, I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going I'm to show you what your spiritual gift test shows us, okay? So, again, first week, you're a visitor. Second week, I got you to come back for breakfast. I gave you a spiritual gift test. I tell you a little bit about your spiritual gifts, and then I say, yeah, you go try out all the other churches, but now I need you back here one more week because I'm going to give you the results of your spiritual gift test and help you understand more about you. Now, everybody in your church... Their second favorite topic is Jesus. Their number one favorite topic is themselves. I want to tell you about you. Make sure you come back for the third week. Well, if you come back three weeks in a row, I got you. I, mean, I almost got you, okay? So here's the problem. Here's the way I feel. I feel like the pastor across town is trying to light fire with two sticks over here, rubbing them together. I Over here, I got a Bic lighter. I got the fire going because I got a system in place. Okay. Do you have a system in place in your church? Okay. Rule number three is promotion. Whatever the pastor promotes, whatever outreach, uh, more parishioners want to help. The pastor addresses the thing that have the greatest value. I, I won't talk about that very long, but pastors, if you're talking about every single thing in the church, you know, be here for the bake sale. Need volunteers to help with kids ministry. Make sure you sign up for the you know, auction. Make sure you sign up your kids. On, nobody's hearing anything you say. I don't announce anything except if you're a first-time guest, stay after, go by Guest Central. I want to meet you. That is it, okay? Because the church doesn't grow by bake sales. I grew up in a church had a bake sale every month. It never grew, okay? So you, you can't talk about everything. Rule number four is the rule of involvement. Influence, I'm sorry, guys. We don't have time. I don't, I don't want to go through all of this. Um. And there we reach the end. Let me wrap up by telling you this. As I, as I thought about how I could, how I could maybe in, invest in you, what I wanted to do is give you exposure to a new way of thinking, okay? If you think to yourself, man, he, he breezed through that stuff too fast. I couldn't catch all that. I, I, I didn't want you to catch it all. I wanted you to have a new way of thinking. What if our church didn't just, didn't just have um, a great presentation? Listen, the, the presentation of the gospel is the greatest story ever told. Jesus did that for us, okay? We didn't have to do any work. We just told that story. What we can do for Jesus is build a system in place that builds his church, okay, that works with him to build the church. And so um, that's what I think you can do. I think you can t contextualize this, make it work in your local setting, wherever you are. Um, and we, we can help you. Again, if you go by our booth, we'd love to talk to you before you leave. Um, and if you uh, use that promo code CLF2023, when you go to that website, anything you see on there that could help you, if you get the 24-month system, we also have a lot of just uh, different trainings and materials, you get 20% off if you use CLF2023.